and welcome again to Pleasant Hill Baptist Church um, for our Bible study this evening on 1st John. I can tell you that personally I am very happy to be here tonight for a number of reasons, uh, but mostly just to be able to get into God's Word, and uh, I'm glad that you joined me. Uh, tonight we'll be doing 1st John, uh, or at least part of it, and I would like to open with a word of prayer first. Lord, thank you for this evening. Thank you for your word and, and thank you for revealing it to us. Uh, the Holy Spirit makes our minds alive to your word so that we can understand it, so that we can know why it was left for us and what we are to do. We thank you especially tonight for John. We thank you for the epistle that he wrote, this first John. We ask you to make a mark on our hearts and on our minds in some way that we need it and we can use it. In Jesus' name, amen. I don't know if you've noticed it or not, but first John is somewhat different than the other epistles in the New Testament. Generally, uh, if you go through the Bible, you'll notice that the epistles are written by someone to someone or a church. They're very specific with an introduction and a greeting to the recipients of the epistle or the letter. It usually contains a greeting. Uh, these letter uh, a first John doesn't contain either one of those things. It's more like the book of Hebrews uh, or James. Uh, it just goes straight into what John wanted to relay. There's a reason, however, for this omission, because by that stage of the early church, John was the only one who could have written this epistle. John was the only one who could have spoken with such an authoritative tone and been received by the church as readily as this letter apparently was. It's likely that 1 John was written late in the first century, probably between 90 and 95. We can't date it specifically because there aren't any historical markers that are mentioned in the uh, document itself. Usually there'll be some kind of reference to one thing or another that is commonly known to have happened at a particular time in history. Not so in this particular epistle. There are no historical markers. The persecutions of Domitian, which started in 95, are not mentioned as they most certainly would have been if it had, was ongoing at that time. So it was before that in all likelihood. Um, in addition, John is obviously advanced in age because he uses expressions like my little children and so on. Uh, so it's probably between 90 and 95 that it was written. Most likely, John was in Ephesus when he wrote it, having been released from exile from the, uh, the island of Patmos. Now, we don't know that for certainty uh, because there is no document in the church um, history or archives that says that John was released. Uh, but John was the apostolic leader of the churches in the Near East. Uh, because of that, we believe that he was in Ephesus at that time, near the end of his life, and wrote this epistle. Uh, the thrust of the epistle is his concern about heresies that were breaking forth uh, during this time. Now, Judaism had long been an issue with the early church, but around the year 48, approximately, in the Jerusalem Council, Judaism, or the Judaizers, had been squelched, or at least uh, problematically had been squelched, although they occasionally continued to rear their heads. So in all likelihood, John was not writing to address the Judaizers. What had become uh, at this time a heresy that was on the horizon and blooming, if you will, was Gnosticism. That's okay. 
Gnosticism. Uh, those of you that know me and have attended my classes probably realize how comfortable, more, how much more comfortable I am with my whiteboard. But in any event, um, Gnosticism, it's from the Greek Gnostikos, meaning to have knowledge or having knowledge. It morphed into various forms, uh, but basically consisted of these ideas. All matter or material in the universe is tainted and therefore evil. So just mark it down. Matter or material is evil. Souls are trapped inside a human body, and the urge is to get out of this prison. A uh, human body, of course, is material and is therefore evil. Flesh is evil. The world was created by an imperfect deity. That imperfect deity to the Gnostics was the God of Abraham. Creation is related in the Bible, uh, as related in the Bible, is a lie. Um, as evidenced by all the tragedy and evil in the world, the Gnostics claimed, as many people do today, that a loving God would never have made a world with so much tragedy and evil in it. Um, that's a subject for another class, but anyway, nonetheless, that's what Gnosticism leaned on, and because evil and tragedy is prevalent in the world, um, a lot of people bought into this. Uh, Gnosticism also gave birth to kind of a stepchild, another heresy called Docetism. This is the doctrine that says that Christ's body was not human at all, but rather a phantasm. Um, or if it was real, it was some sort of celestial material uh, that that made it appear as though Christ was on earth among us. His person was apparent rather than real. Christ, being divine, would never have touched flesh because it's evil. He certainly would not have indwelt a human body. Being divine, he, had, he could have no relationship at all with matter, Therefore, according to Docetism, Jesus only appeared to be human. Jesus only appeared to die. And the Christ that was in Jesus was withdrawn from him before the crucifixion. Take away Jesus being fully God and fully man, and you take away the atonement, and we are still in our sins. So this is what John was writing to contend with. This obviously was a huge problem, especially in the early church, that was looking to find its roots. And what's more, the early church had been in existence for approximately 60, 70 years, and many congregations were becoming comfortable with the idea of Christianity. And the philosophers of the day were looking to creep in and make it more worldly sensible, if you will, more rational. Um, this was a problem that John felt compelled to straighten out. So let's get into 1 John. I'm going to begin with chapter 1, the first five verses, I will tell you that I use the New King James Version. Um, I don't care what version you use. I'm not here to stump for a particular version. I like this because it's the closest to the original English translation, um, the King James. But nonetheless, you might find your verbiage a little different, but the meaning is the same. We'll begin with verse 1. That which was from the beginning which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled concerning the word of life. The life was manifested and we have seen and bear witness and declare to you that eternal life, which was with the Father and was manifested to us. That which we have seen and heard, we declare to you 
that you may have fellowship with us. And truly, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And these things we write to you that your joy may be full. You'll notice right off the bat that the greeting or the introduction that I mentioned earlier is missing. John gets right to the point. At this stage in the life of the church, there is only one man that's going to write a letter and like this, and there's going to be no question who it's from and the level of authority that has written it. The language, too, was so like John that there's no reason to question who it was from. Um, in verse 1, John mentions a beginning, but which beginning? There are actually three beginnings that, that can possibly be referenced here. There is one mentioned uh, in Genesis 1-1, of course, where God created the heaven and the earth. Another, interestingly, occurs in John 1-1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God. All things were made by him, and without him nothing was made. So in other words, we cannot imagine a time when Jesus, God, did not exist. There is no time that he didn't exist. So from verse 1, John is in no uncertain terms refuting what the Gnostics are teaching. In the beginning, there are two beginnings there. So, um, the third beginning is when Jesus is born of a virgin, Mary having been touched by the Holy Spirit. Okay? When Jesus was around 30 years old, that's when John met him. Now, there's no question, there's no question that this is a third beginning. Because when Jesus' ministry began, life changed for everyone. It would, of course, change permanently with the crucifixion and the resurrection. But a new time, a new era was marching. But John was making certain that the churches in, the, in Asia Minor that he was speaking to realized that Jesus was incarnated. He was real. He was here and he lived amongst us. John immediately refutes in the strongest claims or terms the claims that the Gnostics made, terms which can only relate to the actual physical existence of Jesus are repeated over and over in these opening verses. I guess John repeated them over and over just in case someone was so slow that they failed to pick up what his meaning was. Um, remember, by this point, all the other apostles had been martyred for this exact same reason. John was the only one left. Every other apostle had been martyred for their insistence that they had known, lived, and ministered with Jesus Christ, who had physically died, who physically lived and had physically died and was raised again. This was the gospel. And that by believing on that, believing on the witness of these folks that had lived with him and known him, and realized that he was able to atone for our sins. By believing that, that was the gospel. That was the good news of Jesus Christ. In verse 2, he says, that eternal life, and then goes on to say, that was manifested. The life was manifested, and we have seen and bear witness. John circles back around to the eternal nature of Jesus prior to his incarnation. Jesus is eternal life. Many times it's stated in such a way that through Jesus is eternal life. Jesus himself 
is eternal life. It's by having and possessing him that we're able to attain that. No, not something else to be grasped or attained or sought or um, looked for, but to pos the possession of Christ, that personal relationship, is eternal life. By his incarnation, he was manifested. What does manifested mean? It means seen, touched, known, um, reality made relevant to us. Known to mankind in general and to the apostles and John specifically. Verse 3, he talks about um, that we have seen and heard and declare to you that, we may, that you may have fellowship with us. Now, I'm afraid sometimes Baptist uh, and maybe some other denominations, I'll let you determine what your church is like. Um, I'm not saying this is always the case, but I think sometimes Baptists believe that fellowship is potluck dinners and movie nights. I think that's become the common term for fellowship. That's not what it originally was. To fellowship was the gathering of believers to share the things of Christ. Now, somebody may bring a potato casserole along with them uh, as an aside, but that was not the purpose of fellowshipping. Fellowshipping was distinctly about the things of Christ. And what he's talking about here, to fellowship, fellowship equates with salvation, the things of Christ. Originally, fellowship in the church was to gather to share those things. If we are in Christ, then we will never be out of fellowship with him or with others who are in him. To fellowship means never being alone in Christ. To fellowship means the body of believers. Potlucks are fine. But John's telling these folks something then that are, that's applicable today. Do we get together and talk about the things of Jesus? Do we get together to grow our relationship with him? Or has our worship time, our study time, become secularized as well? I don't know. But John was talking about the same things then, that can have influences on us today. Verse 4, that you may have that joy, the reality of the gospel, the salvation provided by that gospel, and the fellowship that is enjoyed or can be enjoyed is the emphasis. The only things that the true follower of Christ really needs the Gnostics, or the false teachers in general, were layering on human invention to interfere with the joy that can be experienced by knowing and meditating on the pure word of God. The further we get, and the further we get from apostolic teaching, the further we feel like it requires specific programs or music and something other than the Word of God to save folks, 
then we're relying on human invention and not the Word of God. And that's what John's talking about here. We're going to move on to verses 5 to 10. This is the message that we have heard from him and declare to you, that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in the darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. In verse 5, the heretics, the Gnostics, and others claimed to be the enlightened ones and the ones who walked in the light. But they were in such darkness in reality that they didn't even recognize that they had a sin nature. In fact, they denied that they had such. By claiming that they were souls trapped in human bodies, they claimed they were not responsible for what those human bodies did. Of course the human bodies sinned. Human bodies are flesh. Flesh is material. All material is evil. Everyone knows that. So they're not responsible for those sins. They're not sins. The fault is of the body, and they are not part of the body. Since it was natural that matter was evil, of course their bodies did evil things, John also here forcefully argues that God is not an imperfect deity, but is the light that guides men into righteousness that they cannot find on their own. Elsewhere, Jesus talks about being a light unto our path. Um, I am firmly convinced that there would be no light in existence if there were no Christians on the earth. I believe if you get far enough into Revelation, you're going to find that the uh, lack of light is going to be an issue at some point, at least for some, um, not for me, and I hope not for you. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, in verse 6, this verse sounds especially harsh because John is calling us liars. And I believe this is part of the, what, the real crux of this part of the epistle, this part of the book. Now, it's not me saying it. It's John saying it. And John's saying it to me just like he is to you. He's speaking of those who claim Christ and are continuing to walk in sin. And furthermore, they're continuing walking in sin without recognizing it as sin. We must be liars if we are doing this because God contains no darkness. And if we are joined with God through Jesus Christ, we're not going to contain darkness either. Now, John is not saying that if we are saved, we are perfect and sinless. Of course not. What he's saying is that we are conscious of how fallen we are and how sin-ridden we are. And we are constantly confessing our sins to God. And if we're doing that, we're cognizant of who we are and how much beholden to God we are to have any relationship with him at all. It is not through anything we do. It is all through our faith in Jesus Christ, our belief in him, our throwing ourselves at the foot of the cross 
and relying on him to speak for us to God the Father. Now the Gnostics didn't think they had to do that. They didn't recognize the sin nature. They didn't recognize that they were sinners. They recognized no need for salvation at all. Yet, they represented themselves to the church as Christians that just had new and better ideas. I don't really like personally verses like this um, because they really call us out. I don't know how much I personally continue to do or think or say that I don't recognize as sin because it's become so, so habitual. I don't know. Hopefully nothing, but I'm sure there's probably something. Maybe you're in the same boat. Maybe you think that your life in Christ has nothing to do with how you behave, how you speak to others, or how you relate to non-Christians. I don't know. The Gnostics, once again, that John is speaking to, did not con con uh, claim any sin. They claimed to be the especially enlightened ones. In verse 7, again, if we walk in the light, which is the true knowledge of our fallenness, in full reliance on Christ to present us faultless to God the Father, then we will enjoy this fellowship that John's talking about. In fact, it's the only way we can enjoy that fellowship. That fellowship, again, is continuing and unending. This also means that this light should be reflected in our daily lives and not as a false front, but as something that is genuinely being generated from our hearts. Verse 8, these false teachers presented themselves as Christians, but of course with a more enlightened understanding of Jesus. What these fellows were teaching, however, demonstrated that they were not Christians at all. They denied their sin nature. There is nothing more basic to Christ's atonement than to realize your personal condemnation under sin and to recognize a need to be forgiven. There's nothing more basic than that. Without that, there is indeed no Christ, no need for crucifixion, no need for resurrection. If we don't recognize that we're cut off, that we're lost, we don't need a Savior. Verse 9, here is where you and I, as Christians, can walk in the light with God. Continual confession of our disobedience to God, which is to acknowledge our sin to be the same as God sees it. In other words, when we look at sin and acknowledge it, we need to try to step outside of our shoes and move around to the other side and see what we say, do, through the eyes of God. View it as he sees it. Many people, and some Christians that I know, have a tendency to look at, well, that's not so bad. Well, yeah, um, by worldly standards, it may not be so bad, but that's not how sin is judged. Sin is judged through the eyes of God the Father. And for us to truly acknowledge and confess our sins, we're to view it through his eyes. Usually, we don't have to look at it too awfully close because if we even, at least in my experience, if I even try to move around to the other side before I even get there, I know where I'm lining up on this, whatever the issue may be. We acknowledge and fully understand that we have, we are fallen, permanently fallen until the day he takes us home. 
We are out of alignment, so to speak, and can only get straightened out by Christ. Remember, through Christ, God is our Father. He is faithful and just and will forgive us of our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. A good father is not going to throw us out. A good father will not disown us. A good father will teach us and forgive us and welcome us back as if we had never left the fold to begin with. I believe there's a story in the New Testament about that somewhere, if I'm not mistaken. And lastly, in verse 10, John points out the blasphemy of the false teachers by pointing out that God said everyone is a sinner. And they're contending that they do not have a sin nature and have not sinned. So they are, in fact, saying that God is a liar. Um, it's not a word that's used very often anymore, but there is such a thing as blasphemy today, just like there was then. Um, I would not want to be one of the fellows that said this. We're going to stop there because I learned something the first week doing this, that um, about 30 minutes is long enough, and this gets us through the first chapter of uh, 1 John, and next week we will move into chapter 2 um, and get into some more of the meat uh, of the uh, letter. Would you join us or join me in prayer to end this, please? Father, we thank you. Um, that we have John and other people like him to speak to us uh, is clearly today, if we'll listen, as 2,000 years ago. There is nothing new under the sun. We need to be taught, and we need to look at the things around us as lessons that you send to teach us. If we are in you, we know that you'll send nothing that is not meant for our good, even if it hurts. So if you're sending it for our good, even if it hurts, there must be something in what is going on in our lives that you want us to learn from. Lord, help us to depend on you. Help us to recognize the importance, which is it, the only thing that John's really addressing, the importance of sound doctrine. Lord, I ask that you be with everyone at the point of their need, even those who we don't know that might be watching this. We ask for your blessing on each and every one of them. We ask that we all come closer to you. And we ask that you keep them safe and healthy during the coming week. In Jesus' name, amen. Good night.